Tune in Saturday, 12 to 3 Eastern, the Buck Sexton Show. The Blaze Radio Network. Who decides when the United States Senate is in session? That was a question today before the Supreme Court in a case styled National Labor Relations Board versus Canning. It's also the question for our table. Now, if you'll remember, two years ago, President Obama proclaimed that the United States Senate was not in session, that they were on recess, and as such, he could make recess appointments to three members of the NLRB board and Richard Cordray, the head of the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Now, you see, the recess appointment clause, a recess appointment, what does that mean? Well, let me show you the Constitution of the United States. In Article 2, Article two Section 2, Clause 3 of the Constitution, you can zoom in there, you can see it says this. The President shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of the next session. Now, what that meant originally was that if the Senate was between sessions from one year to the next and say something happened, like a cabinet member died and needed to be appointed before the Senate came back, the president could make what was known as a recess appointment. But that has evolved over time. Well, the, because the, I'm sorry, please, the original go. intention was because if you're in Charleston or wherever and you need to get to Philadelphia by horse, that's not going to happen in a couple hours. So it was to, to be able to keep the government running smoothly because they couldn't travel as quickly they, as they can. The, the two words that are at issue and that are essential now have a different understanding based upon recent history than they did then. Happened, as you point out, would have meant someone died during the recess, really. It wasn't supposed to be a pre-existing opening because why would you even have that and then recess of course is what we're going to talk about which is no but what you, is make, a recess. you make a point which i was going to hit on is, is that originally it meant that event that vacated the position happened during the break um, then it began to become a point where you could take care of business that maybe you didn't get done during the session so during the break you could make a, uh, an appointment like buck pointed out uh, get things done that the senate hadn't quite accomplished during its uh, normal session. But then what happened is the Senate decided, uh, the President decided he could make appointments on any normal break, not just between sessions, any normal break of the, of the Senate. Now, during Warden Harding's administration, he limited that to 28 days. If the Senate took a break of any kind of 28 days, he could begin to make recess appointments. That shortened again over time. And during President Bush, the second administration, if the Senate was off for any more than 10 days, he began to make recess appointments. Now, this did not sit well, by the way, with Harry Reid at the time, the Democratic leader of the Senate. He adopted a formula where he would come in and gavel, game the system every three days to make sure they were not on break, to keep President Bush from making those recess appointments. That is exactly what Republicans decided to do to President Obama when they opposed some of his nominations. They would come in, gavel in for three days, suggest they're in session, gavel in, I'm sorry, every three days, suggest they're in session, go home, and they're never on it's break. It's almost like Harry Reid's opposition to this is hypocritical. <laughs> it's almost, almost like that. Well, the question remains, who decides when the Senate is in session? Because President Obama said, that does not count anymore. You are on break. I can make my recess appointments. He has been denied at three lower courts. Jay K Carney suggested that no matter, they still feel confident in their position. Listen to Jay Carney. It uh, contradicts 150 years of uh, practice by uh, Democratic and Republican administrations. So we respectfully but strongly disagree with the rulings. There have been, according to the Congressional Research, uh, Research Service, something like 280 plus intra-session recess appointments by, again, Democratic and Republican administrations dating back to 1867. Uh, that's a long time. So, the basic question, who gets to decide when the United States Senate is in session? Joining us now is Dave Kopel. He's professor of advanced constitutional law at the University of Denver and a research director of the Independence Institute, which filed an amicus brief in this case. Uh, Dave, let, let me know, what, what do you think? A very basic question to start this, who decides when the Senate is in session? The, the Senate, and it's quite a usurpation of power for the president uh, to assert that he can decide when the Senate is in session. The Constitution requires that both houses of uh, Congress keep a journal of their activities. And the Senate journal for those days plainly reflected that the Senate was in session. You know, an end of question on that uh, as a proper constitutional matter. Right, and, and, and the, uh, if you had answered any other way, the point is this, this changes the balance of power in a fundamental way, right? If the president gets to decide when the Senate is gaveled in or on break or in session or in recess, that changes everything, does it not? That's right. They are co they are co-equal branches, and the the president doesn't get to decide uh, what constitutes a session of the Senate. The Senate decides that. 
Hi, Dave. I have a question really quick. Um, it just when you look at this case, um, I'm wondering how broadly is the Supreme Court going to rule? Are they going to take us all the way back to the lowest common constitutional denominator, so to speak, say that no, you can only fill a, a position, a recess appointment you can only make if that person, if it happens, if it's vacated during a recess. Are they going to go all the way back there? Are they going to rule narrowly? And either way, is it bad for President Obama? Uh, it, well, it, it's bad for President Obama's illegal appointment uh, to the National Labor Relations Board, uh, but it, it's good for the country to follow the text of what the Constitution says. Uh, a, as you say, there, there's two ways they can do it. One is, and the narrowest one, is simply to say that, that the recess uh, is what the Senate decides is the recess and not something that the President can, can overrule them on. And then the, the second issue is uh, when does the vacancy happen? And the, uh, they don't have to, if they rule on the recess issue, they don't have to rule on the happen issue. But I think it's, it's more likely that they will because uh, this will be the first Supreme Court decision on this clause. So to provide clarity to lower courts in other situations, they may want to uh, express what I think the text of the Constitution pretty clearly says, that if a, a, va a vacancy that may happen during the recess is when the vacancy arises during the recess. It has to happen during the recess, not being a condition that arose earlier. Just to illustrate Dave's point and to, to your question, Kristen, I'm going to put up, Buck, this is the number of recess appointments over the last several administrations. It's become a tool used very, very much more readily, much more frequently, you can see, with each president. It's, it's far, far removed from the original intention of the recess appointment. Clause. And, that, and that's exactly what the argument the government was making today was, essentially, which is that, well, the trend is moving in this direction. The progress, if you will, is going towards the eradication of this prerogative that's within the Senate. That's the argument that Carney was that, making. That, that's exactly right. Well, because we've basically been chipping away at this and making it non-existent that the Senate even has to confirm uh, these nominees. Let's just keep going with that. The judges, from what we can tell, were very, uh, no, that's not actually going to fly. But what I also think is interesting is, you know, at a, at a more basic level, they can't find anybody else. Like, what purpose does it serve for the administration to be so dead set on these particular nominees? Oh, no, we have to get them through, other than to make the Senate bend the knee in front of an imperial presidency. And and this, is what, this is what this really comes and down to. And it's because it's about it, political expediency in the U.S usurpation of power when it comes to what they need now. Screw the, the Constitution. They've done this consistently. This is consistent with how they rule because they needed pro-labor folks on the National Labor Relations Board. And that's what this is about. I was right. surprised this actually mm -hmm. even went to the Supreme Court because to me and you know from being in Congress, a pro forma session has such a clear definition, which is what they say they were in during this, which is just a brief meeting where they gavel in and they don't do votes, but they kind of hold like a business talk of the day. There would be redefining so many different terms in this case if they ruled in favor of what he did. It wouldn't just be who decides recess, it would also be the technical terms of yes, what of course. Da Dave, um, as a former CIA guy, I hesitate to use the term slam dunk case but this seems to be a, a slam dunk case if you will and the administration looks to me like they're gonna get beaten pretty badly on this point but I would also bring up what does that really mean other than there's going to be some uh, decisions that were made by the NLRB that will be rolled back because Harry Reid exercised afterwards the nuclear option so in a sense this is kind of null and void isn't it you've got, you don't need the 60 votes anymore a simple majority can get uh, people's names in front of the floor. So it's changed the dynamics, I should say, of the nomination process, regardless of the outcome of this decision. Oh, that, that's right. And I think that's one of the practical things that makes it easier for the court to adhere to the text of the Constitution is the filibuster rule uh, change does reduce the possibility of, uh, of gridlock. So for example, those NLRB appointments, which were uh, illegal at the time President Obama made them, uh, as recess appointments have since been made properly and the uh, properly constituted N NLRB could now have a quorum and go ahead and uh, take all those old uh, usurpation decisions that it made and ratify them and have them be legitimate decisions going forward. Well, this further supports the case of how important this year's midterm election is and getting control of the Senate back. Because when you have a Senate in control, uh, controlled by people like Harry Reid and their ilk, this is what happens. So if we bring the Senate back, we get some folks in there that respect the Constitution, then we won't have to have these battles. And that is the most amazing thing to me about this, which we have brought up in issues with other things, is that Democrats are operating as if that they're not going to have to deal with these changes that they've made, which they will regret later because Absolutely. someone else will use them against them. And you know, this is pointing out our government is working exactly the way that it's supposed to. Republicans and the party and the opposition has every single right to fight 
the nominations of the opposing party. They have every right to do that constitutionally. The judges said it today, and so I think that they're going to rule in not, along with the D.C. court. Now, when you have an imperial president who doesn't but, care, he doesn't care what right, the rights are. Right, but he's out in two years. He's yeah, out in two well, years. So then we'll have all other now. problems. But that's, that's why we're here right now. You know, advise the consent from the Senate. That's in there for a reason. Yeah. We're a right. country with 300 million people. We should have people that both sides say great person for the job, not some political hack activist, which exactly. this administration yes. is basically always giving the but thumbs up to. Just to underline your point and tie two news stories together, it's all somewhat beside the point at this point. Because, Harry, we decided that you only need a simple majority for appointments. No longer do you need a filibuster-proof majority. You won't see these kind of numbers anymore. You won't see these recess, recess appointments uh, used. You now see them rammed through. The Senate has given up its own power, in other words, to the president. Dave, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Up next, the Island of Misfit Stories.